This was the economic stress data, and this was the heavy drinking data, right? And when we, we, we uh, agreed that uh, we should use a continuous censored variable model for, for the economic stress example, and we said we could also perhaps play around with it for the heavy drinking example, and treating this as a continuous uh, development here, although we probably perhaps should take the categorical approach for these data. When it comes to choosing between linear regression and censored regression, it's critical uh, to know, and I always look for this in the summary statistics that come out of M+, how many people are at the lowest value. You know, you get a special uh, uh, output information about that. 30% here, 50%, 59% here. And even here, you know, with 30%, that's above my rule of thumb threshold, 0.25. So in, even in that case, should you get into seriously tight to model this part of the uh, distribution, so censored variable modeling. So we have a lot of choices there too, just like within accounts. <clears throat> so now we're in the area of censored modeling, and we can have censored normal modeling, also called Tobit, after Tobin, and censored inflated, so that the inflation comes in here with the zero class, or sample selection modeling, which is also called Heckman modeling, after Jim Heckman in Chicago or two-part modeling, <coughs> which exists for count outcomes, but now we're going to talk about it for continuous outcomes. <coughs> so here's a picture, which takes a little while to digest, but we can do it. We start with a picture, top left here. What's on the x-axis? Well, it's a predictor or a covariate x. What's on the y-axis? Well, it's the continuous variable y. And you note that uh, if you turn, tilt your head to the left, we're going to do that a lot today, you see the distribution of y here. It has that tail and then a spike here. Uh, and the people uh, are the dots here. The observations are the dots. Several people uh, for low x values have y equals 0. There are these guys. And then for a little higher x values, they start increasing their y value. So start with reading the dots. Now, if you do a correct analysis, uh, you will have this slope, Tobit analysis. But if you take a regular regression analysis, as it's of, often called OLS, ordinary least squares, you will get this kind of uh, slope, this kind of uh, line. That is, you not taking the censoring into account and doing OLS underestimates the slope on x. So underestimating the slope of x if you ignore the censoring is a typical outcome. So what censored or censored normal or Tobit regression tries to do is to figure out where these guys on the uh, y equals zero line here of x, where they should be. Uh, and we try to stretch them out like this. We put place them out in this tail of the distribution. You know, these guys, if you tilt your head to the left again, they create a tail. We stretch them out down here. And we do that, of course, by uh, statistical magic, as usual. Uh, how can you tell where they are? I mean, these people, how do you know how far down on the tail they are? Well, you know something, uh, x. Uh, you estimate the, the regression coefficient for x. And you see that for low x values, then, <clears throat> the lower the x value, the higher the probability that they're far down the tail. That's how it works. And of course, then you can. Um, see that it relies heavily on the distributional assumption for this, the distributional assumption for the tail. We're going to work the, with the normal, because that's the standard model here. <clears throat> so you have, you, you see also that I changed from y to y star here for the dependent variable. And uh, y star is then the continuous latent response variable, just like u star was earlier for binary outcome. So we have a linear regression for y star. <clears throat> it has a intercept slope and a residual. And we're going to say that the observed value, y is the observed variable, has the value 0 for if y star is less than or equal to 0. And it's observed it identical to y star if y star is greater than 0. So that's the censoring. Everybody who has a value less than 0 Every, all of these people get smashed into a one pile of people in this not distinguished between. So that's what this says. That's the Tobit model. 
And it has two parts then. You have a, a binary part for modeling the probability of y greater than zero or not. And with normality assumption, that's one minus the probability of being below that point. This is the standard STAT 101. Phi is a normal distribution function. Uh, if you want the probability of being below, it's the, the value itself, zero, minus the mean, which is this part. This is the mean divided by the standard deviation. All of this given x. So value minus the mean divided by standard deviation, that is the normal distribution function argument. So that's the probability of being below zero, and one minus that's the probability of being above. And due to the symmetry of the phi function, we just change the sign of this to turn it into getting rid of the one minus, and then having plus beta zero plus beta one divided by this. Anyway, that's how it works. Continuous positive part, expectation, expectation here means, it says that it's the mean, the mean in the population for y. For those people who are above zero, you know, these people, what's the mean? What's the mean function? Well, it's the regular regression coefficients here, beta zero plus beta one x, <clears throat> but then plus a term, which is uh, uh, the normal density, that's a normal distribution, lowercase phi, and this is the uh, no normal distribution function again. This is a nonlinear term which captures the shape of this. <coughs> now, uh, we estimate both of these parts. And what the limitation of this model is then clear here uh, that this beta here for the probability is the same as this beta for the uh, continuous positive outcomes. And we would prefer to have them different. But in this first model, they're one and the same. <clears throat> so we're going to go to sensory inflated regression, where we're going to end up with uh, one equation with gamma 1 and one equation with beta 1. We're going to make those slopes different, just like we did for zero inflated Poisson to get, make that more flexible. So once again, we're going to have a latent class that we call class 0, subjects for whom only y equals 0 is observed, and a class 1 subjects following a censored normal Tobit model as on this first, on slide 37. <clears throat> so then we have a logistic regression that describes the probability of being in class zero, a linear logit model as usual, standard logistic regression. And for subjects in class one, we have the usual censored normal for y star here. And once again, there are two ways y equals zero is observed. It's a mixture at zero just like for the count. So it's very similar to uh, count inflation. So inflation, once again, means that you uh, have a class at zero and a class that can be above zero. <clears throat> and it helps modeling uh, the outcome in a more flexible way. Two different slopes. Sample selection Heckman modeling uh, is related to this, but slightly different. So the Y star equation looks very much the same. But in this case, the latent response variable is observed as y star, just like for Tobit, but remains latent that is missing if u equals 0. So it's missing in this case. This was developed by Jim Heckman and others for uh, uh, wages of uh, female labor participants. If a female was in the labor force, they would have an observed wage y equals y star. But if they weren't working, then the wage is not zero, but it's missing. We don't have an observation for what the wage could have been if they got into the labor force. In this case, uh, Heckman works with a probit regression for u star. So the uh, residual delta is normal. And uh, we have the usual uh, threshold formulation for probit. Instead of an intercept gamma zero, it's a threshold tau. Uh, measuring uh, whether or not u star is above tau, the thresholds. And the key feature is that the residuals epsilon and delta, what are they? They're sitting here, epsilon and delta. They are assumed to be correlated and have a bivariate normal distribution with the usual probe standardization. So they are correlated, potentially. And now, you never observe uh, both of these uh, u stars and y stars. <clears throat> Uh, you only observe uh, 
part of the picture, that is, when a, a woman is working, you observe Y star. So two-part regression, then, as a final uh, version, censoring from below at zero and using probit regression. The two-part model is probit for pi. <clears throat> and then we have a special model for the log of the outcome for those who are not at zero. So this line, vertical line here, is given that we are considering those with uh, u equals 1 in the u equals 1 class. So we have a linear regression for that. And you can have a logistic regression if you want to, instead of probe regression. And the interesting part here is a maximum likely estimation of the two-part model gives the same estimates if the binary and continuous parts were estimated separately. But um, in this case, we have bivariate <coughs> normal residuals, and they can be correlated. But the point here is that the correlation does not enter into the likelihood and is not estimated. And that is a strength of this modeling. You don't have to, uh, for Heckman modeling, you have to assume bivariate normality for epsilon and delta, those residuals. And that model has been severely criticized by statisticians for that reason. Uh, but to, in two-part regression, you don't have that feature. So comparing them, finally, then, um, censored inflated Heckman and two-part. Like the censored inflated and Heckman models, the two-part model has a different, a different regression equations for the two parts, so gamma 1 and beta 1. It was the Tobit model, the censored normal model, that only had one slope. But we have two slopes for all of these three models. But unlike the censored inflated model, the two-part model does not have a mixture at zero, and nor does Heckman. So the mixture is only for the censored inflated. So two-part modeling and Heckman modeling does not involve mixture modeling. And unlike the Heckman model, a two-part model does not estimate the residual correlation between the two parts. And this was stressed by Niawa Duan, who was at the RAND Corporation in the 80s in Santa Monica, California, is now at Columbia pointed to two advantages of the two-part model over Heckman. <clears throat> he worked with uh, medical care expenses, which they studied a lot uh, at the RAND Corporation. And he thought the two-part model was preferable to Heckman because a censoring point of zero expense does not represent missing data, but rather a real observed value. So he didn't buy into Heckman's missing data thinking. And the bivariate normality assumption for the residuals is not needed. So, Two-part modeling is quite useful, and um, it also comes back in uh, growth modeling, which, uh, where it's very useful as well. OK, and with that, um, I think it's back to the other speaker. Yeah. All right. So now we're going to look at heavy drinking. <laughs>